All right, guys, today we start chapter five. And in this chapter, we're gonna move from the description of motion, kinematics, to looking at the causes of motion, dynamics, and when we put the two together, we'll have mechanics, okay? So chapter five is all, is all going to be about describing what a force is, determining what kind of forces we're gonna encounter, and then putting those forces to work. So let's define force. A force is a push or a pull. Every force is caused by an agent and it acts on an object. So a force is part of an interaction between two things, like a bat and a baseball, okay? If the bat hits the baseball, then the bat is the agent of the force and the baseball is the object that is experiencing the force. A force is a vector quantity, okay? Forces can be either contact forces or they can be non-contact forces. Now, a contact force means that the objects that are interacting touch, okay? They physically make contact with each other. A tennis racket and a tennis ball, a hammer and a nail. A non-contact force, also called a force at a distance, is a force that's exerted even when the object and the agent don't physically touch. So gravity, uh, magnets interacting are examples of non-contact forces. Now remember, a force arises from an interaction between two things. You cannot have a force without an interaction. So if you can't identify an agent of a force, you're not looking at a real force. And we're going to introduce something that people call a force that's not a real force eventually. I'm going to point it out to you. So let's look at our forces, our list of forces. Okay? First, we have the force due to gravity, F sub G. The force due to gravity acting on an object for us is a force that is the pull of the earth downward on an object that's close to its surface. Force due to gravity is a non-contact force. Force due to gravity is always going to point down toward the center of the earth, okay? So, let me draw you a couple of pictures here. So, if this was the ground, and I have a rock here, force due to gravity is gonna pull straight down if I had a rock sitting here, okay, force due to gravity is still straight down toward the center of the earth. All right? Okay. Let's see. Let's get back over here. Where did I put my mark? I think that'll work. Let's see if we're there. All right, guys, now let's think about our next force. It's a spring force, force SP, FSP. A spring force, uh, uh, remember that gravity is always just a pull. Gravity can never push, okay? So gravity is always a pull. A spring force is either a push or a pull supplied by a spring. And it depends on whether the spring is compressed or stretched whether it is pushing or pulling. A spring force is a contact force. If the spring force isn't in contact with the object, it will apply no force to that object. A tension, T, is a pull due to a rope string or a beam. A tension is always a pull, it can never be a push. A tension force always points along the rope, string, or beam. And a tension force is a contact force. A normal force is a contact force perpendicular to the area of contact between two objects, okay? So it often is defined as the force exerted by a surface on an object pressing against the surface. Normal forces are always pushes. A normal force can never be a pull. 
Next is friction. Okay? Friction, we always use the lowercase f as a symbol, is a surface contact force that's parallel to the surface and always points in the direction that would oppose motion. So when we think about frictional force, we're going to talk about pushing in one direction with some other force or pulling with a, uh, a rope. The frictional force always points in the opposite direction. So if you're doing something to try to move an object to the left, the frictional force would be pointing to the right and would be opposing that. The kinetic friction is a frictional force we see when an object is moving. A static frictional force is a frictional force that's being applied when the object is sitting still. So I'm applying a force to try to get it to move and it's not quite moving yet. That's a static frictional force. A drag force is related to, stat uh, to a frictional force because it's a resistive force, just like the frictional force, it opposes motion. But it's due to moving through a fluid. So dragging something through water, or you walking through air, there's a drag force. Thrust, we use capital T for thrust, just like we did for tension. But thrust is a force exerted by a, ga uh, by a jet engine. We'll talk a little bit more about thrust later. And then lastly, the electromagnetic force, F sub E, it's a non-contact force, and it can push or pull, and it's a force we see between the charged particles. We'll spend a lot of time talking about electromagnetic forces next semester. Okay? So one of the first things we have to be able to do is we have to be able to look at an object and identify all the forces that are acting on an object. Okay? So it's time for us to play with pretty pictures again. So let's see how much of the board I got here. Ah, we got a good amount of board. Okay. So here's the floor. Here's a chair. And here's a person, wee, sitting in the chair. I know they're out of proportion. Okay, let's think about the forces on the person. Well, I know that the chair pushes up and it's a normal force. I'll put in sub chair. Because they're sitting on the chair, the chair is pushing up on them. Okay? There's also gravity. Force due to gravity is pulling down on them. So if the person is sitting here in the chair and their back's not up against the back of the chair, there are only these two forces acting on the person. Okay? So I've identified the forces acting on them. Now, Let's go with something just a little bit more. So let's take an inclined plane here, okay? And I'm gonna sit a box on it. And that box has a rope attached that goes over a pulley and it's being pulled down. So I got a person standing here going heave ho with the rope. Whee, they're pulling down. So let's think about all the forces on the box. Okay, well, number one, there's a normal force from where the box is making contact with the inclined plane. Okay, there is a tension because the rope is pulling on the box. And there is a force due to gravity. So on our box, as it's sitting right here on an inclined plane, it's experiencing three forces. Okay? Now, how about this box? Okay, 
this is a rope and it's tied to a ring that's attached to the box. So you can consider the ring part of the box. What are the forces acting on the box? Hopefully you said there's force due to gravity and there's a tension. Okay? So, you should be able to look at a, an object and start identifying the forces that are acting on it. Okay. Now the next question we've got to ask is once we have a force, what exactly does a force do? Okay. So let's think about what happens when a force is applied. Now let me see if I can take something here and give us a look. Let me scoot this down a sec. Okay, guys. All right. Now, let's look at this box. When I apply the force, you can see that the box moves. When I stop pushing, okay, it sits still. I apply a force. The object moves. If I apply a larger force, the object moves faster. Now I want you to notice, okay, I'm only applying a force to it when I'm pushing on it. Once I stop pushing on it, I stop applying a force to it, and notice the object moves for a little bit before it stops, okay? Because when I was pushing on it here, there were two forces acting on it. My push and friction, which was moving opposite. I stopped pushing. Friction was the only force, so it eventually stopped. Okay? So, when we apply a force to an object that's sitting still, we might get it to start moving. Okay? An object that's moving could be slowed down by a force, or it could be sped up by a force, or we could stop it from moving, or we could change its direction. So if I speed something up, I slow something down, or I change its direction, we're causing a change in motional state. Okay? We associate a change in motional state with acceleration. Now, just because an object is experiencing a force doesn't mean that it's going to experience acceleration. Think about you sitting in your chair right now. We know that you're experiencing two forces, a force to gra due to gravity and a force from the chair, a normal force. But you're not changing your emotional state. So that tells us that there's something more than just experiencing a force that causes something to experience a motional state change and acceleration. So what types of forces, okay, do we need to have acceleration? Now, the difference between, let's say, my box here sitting in my hand, okay? It's not moving up, it's not moving down, it's sitting still. And me taking the box and letting it go, okay? Has to do with the net force the object is experiencing as opposed to the individual forces, okay? To have a change in emotional state, an object needs to experience a net force that is not zero. I repeat, to change an object's emotional state, it needs to experience a net force that is not zero. So when I create a net force that's not zero, okay, namely right now, 
there's a pull up of my hand, there's a pull down of gravity. But when I release my hand, there's no pull up from my hand, there's only a pull of gravity, the object moved down. Okay? So, if we apply a force to an object on an inclined plane, and I'm sorry guys, I don't have an inclined plane set up, what we would see if we looked at the data, well you did, you did it in lab last week. When you let the cart roll down the inclined plane, velocity was not constant. Velocity was increasing as you went down the inclined plane, so you had uniform acceleration. When the cart was moving down the inclined plane, it was moving down the inclined plane under the um, force of gravity, under the influence of gravity and gravity only. So it was experiencing a net force down the inclined plane, so you had a uniform acceleration. All right, now. What this tells us is that when force is constant, we have a constant acceleration. Now the next thing we want to ask is if I apply the same if I apply the same force to a more massive object, what does that do to the acceleration? In a regular normal situation, I would do a demo. Let me see if I can carry that off here. Okay? So if it doesn't work real well, you guys know I tried. All right. Now, let's go down. And let's go looking at the tabletop. Okay. Okay, there's my textbook, okay? I'm gonna give it a little shove, okay? So, let's do it again. Now, that's at one mass. Now I'm gonna apply the same shove to just the eraser. Hopefully what you notice there is that the eraser experiencing the same force took off at a higher acceleration, okay? So what we know is that the larger the mass of an object that's experiencing a force, the smaller its acceleration. This means there's an inverse relationship between acceleration and mass and a direct relationship between acceleration and force. So what we can say is acceleration equals force divided by mass. That's the way Newton did it originally. Or we more commonly say force equals mass times acceleration. So you can see if force goes up, acceleration goes up. And the more massive the object is for a given force, the smaller the acceleration is going to be. This relationship is referred to as Newton's second law. So, what we can say is that when the net force is zero, acceleration is zero. So for an individual sitting in a chair, there's no acceleration and no change in motional state because there's no net force. When the net force is not zero, we will see an acceleration. The whole key here is a net force. Now, a net force is a vector sum of all the forces acting on an object. To see a change in motional state, we need a net force that is not zero to cause it to happen. So let's look at the formal statement of Newton's second law. Newton's second law states, an object of mass m subject to forces F1, F2, F3 will undergo an acceleration given by the equation A equals force net divided by m, or we can say force net equals mass times acceleration. Guys, you'll also sometimes see it written in the following way. Let me 
show you this real quick. Okay. We can also write the second law as sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. Some of the forces can be called force net. Yeah, I know. So you could write it like that, okay? Okay, now chapter three, we went into vector summation, breaking things up into X and Y component. That's going to be very important then when we start looking at forces. We're going to have to establish a coordinate system, break our forces up into X and Y components, sum the forces in the X direction, sum the forces in the Y direction to get the net force and the direction of the net force. Now, if we think about force and we think about the units of force, force equals mass times acceleration. Mass is in units of kilograms. Acceleration is in meters per second squared. So a force is a kilogram meter over second squared. One kilogram meter over second squared is one newton. Okay, so we have a new unit, a newton. A newton is a combination unit. It's a new unit formed out of three of our base SI units. Okay? Now, this is a good time for me to talk about the difference between mass and weight. Sometimes in everyday language, we use those two words interchangeably, but they're not the same. Mass is the amount of matter an object contains or more precisely defined, is the measure of an object's resistance to change in velocity. So mass can also be referred to as its inertia. Okay, weight is what a scale reads. If the scale is sitting on the ground on the earth, then weight is the force due to gravity acting on an object or the force provided by the scale to balance out the force due to gravity. If you are moving in an elevator up and down, your weight would be different than your force due to gravity. So weight depends on where you are. An object's weight on the moon would be different than the object's weight on Earth. But an object's mass on the moon would be the same as its mass on Earth. You could even get different weights being at slightly different locations on the Earth. Now it wouldn't differ by that much, but there would be some differences. And it's definitely different if you're riding an elevator up or down. Okay, so weight depends on where you are. Ob uh, mass does not. Now we come to Newton's first law. Notice we did Newton's second law before Newton's first law. Newton's first law says if the net force acting on an object is zero, then the object's acceleration is zero and its velocity is not changing. So if the object was at rest, then it will remain at rest. And if the object is moving, it will remain moving at constant velocity. Now guys, this is what ancient Greeks didn't get. They didn't understand drag or friction the way that we do. So they thought that to keep an object in motion, you had to keep pushing on it. Well, that's true if you don't understand that friction is happening. To keep an, a box sliding across a table, I have to keep pushing on it because friction is opposing my force. But if there was no friction and I started an object moving, it would just keep moving at a constant velocity. That means at a constant speed along a straight line pathway until it experienced a force that created a net force that wasn't zero. So again, an object at rest will remain at rest and an object in motion will remain in motion along a straight line pathway with a constant speed if and only if the net force acting on the object is zero. So this means that some of the forces equal zero 
and we talk about it being in equilibrium, okay? A static equilibrium is when an object is sitting still. And a dynamic equilibrium is when the object is moving at a constant velocity. Okay? So Newton's first law is just a subset of Newton's second law. It says when the net force is zero, acceleration is zero. But it's stated out very clearly here that if it's at rest, sitting still, it'll remain sitting still. And if it's moving at constant velocity, It'll keep moving with that same velocity. Okay, so we can, an object can move at a constant velocity even without being pushed. You do not need a constant force to sustain motion. Now, our inertial reference frame. Okay, our coordinate system, our inertial reference frame is the only reference frame in which Newton's laws can be applied. Now remember, an inertial reference frame is a reference frame that is stationary or traveling at a constant velocity. If, it, if the reference frame has an acceleration, then it is not an inertial reference frame. So if you attached your reference frame to a plane that's on the runway heading out to lift off, it has to accelerate up to speed to lift off, that wouldn't be an inertial reference frame. Okay? If you made your reference frame the radar tower, it would be. So, things to remember about a force. A force has to have an agent. Okay? If you can't identify the agent, you can't identify the force. Forces exist at a point of contact between an agent and an object for a contact force, and it exists along the line that connects, well, the two things that are interacting for a non-contact force. Now, when we get ready to look at forces, chapter six specifically, we're going to be using a lot of free body diagrams. It's a simplified representation of a single object of interest that represents all the forces acting on that object. We're going to draw a Cartesian coordinate system with our object represented as a dot at the origin. And then we're going to draw all the forces and their orientations and their magnitudes in on the free body diagram. Okay. Our choice of orientation of the x and y axis is, is independent of um, other factors. We usually choose the axis so that if we're looking at a motion, the motion will be along one of the axes. So we're going to start off by looking at this problem. And we're going to think about the forces acting on the objects. Okay. So here we have a box A and a box B. Box A and box B are two different objects. Okay, I'm going to treat them as two different objects. Now, you guys think about box A and box B, so let's look at box A and box B and let's draw the forces on them. Okay, now our drawing was box A here, okay, and pulley box B here, and this was sitting on a table. So if I think of box A, okay, box A has a normal force acting on it. It has a force due to gravity acting on it. Now, box A is going to want to move as it moves to the right. Okay? So the frictional force is going to be to the left and it's got a rope attached to it 
So it's got a tension force to the right. So box A has four forces acting on it. Box B down here, okay, box B has a tension on it because it's got a rope and tension is always a pull. I'll call it TB for tension for B. And there's some force due to gravity on it. I'll call it force GB, force gravity on object B. So I have two objects in this picture and object one has four forces acting on it and object two has only two forces acting on it. Okay? Now, if we think about an arrow, okay? Well, I'll just show you a pretty picture. <laughs> arrow! If you think about the forces acting on the arrow, gravity is going to pull down. There is no normal force pushing up on it. And there's a drag force. The arrow is moving that way. The drag force is that way. There are only two forces acting on this arrow. Force due to gravity down and drag force backwards. What do you think the forces are acting on this cup? Drag force pointing up, gravity pointing down. Okay, now let's think about this box. I'm going to draw it over here on my board and then we're going to... Let's move over here and let's draw pretty pictures. Okay, there's our box. Okay. Now, we are looking at a top view. So we're kind of bird's eye view down. Okay, the Z axis is here. We're only looking in the XY plane. And in this case, the XY plane is like on a tabletop. So if I look at this guy right here, there's a pull here, a T1, and there is a pull here, T2. Now, there are forces along the z-axis, but I'm only looking in the xy plane. Those are the only forces acting on that object in the xy plane, as we can see. Um, if we knew something about whether or not it started to move in one direction or another, we could add in a frictional force, but right now we don't have enough information to go anything further than that. see if I've got another picture here. Uh, okay. Let's do the frog. The frog, guys. Okay. There's my friend, Mr. Frog. Now, you guys look at Mr. Frog for a sec. Think about the forces that have to be being applied to Mr. Frog. Mr. Frog is sitting still. He's on an inclined plane. Okay, I'm going to do a very lumpy Mr. Frog. Okay, there's my very lumpy Mr. Frog. Now, because the frog is sitting on an inclined plane, I'm actually going to draw my axis so that my x-axis is parallel to the inclined plane. Oh, so if this is an angle theta, this would be the angle theta. 
Now, force due to gravity is going to pull straight down. If this is the angle theta, this is the angle theta. a vector. There's going to be a normal force pointing straight up. Okay. Now, guys, if you think about this force due to gravity, plus x plus y. Force due to gravity is going to have a force due to gravity x component and a force due to gravity y component. This force due to gravity x component is going to try to move the froggy down the inclined plane. So that means that there has to be some kind of frictional force up the inclined plane. Okay? So when we're talking about inclined planes, hint, we're usually going to orient the x-axis along the inclined plane because any motion is going to be back and forth along the inclined plane, up or down. So it's more convenient to set our axes along a direction that we expect to travel. All right. And this, guys, I do believe, yep, that is the end of chapter five. It's an easy peasy chapter. So get ready for chapter six, where we're going to start taking our forces and sum of forces and working with them.